Good morning, Rose Red Homestead. And today we're going to do something that goes directly to emergency preparedness. Two or three weeks ago, we had a comment under one of our videos from a viewer that had just purchased a new space heater that she said used no electricity and was really great. She got it at Sam's Club for $99 and told me a little bit about it. And I became very intrigued. So I looked it up, did a little bit of research on it, and it does seem very, very intriguing. So we went ahead and bought one. I could never find it for $99. We bought it from Amazon for $149. She had purchased it at Sam's Club, and we have, I have a sister and brother-in-law that live in Salt Lake who do a lot of shopping at Sam's Club, and I sent them over there to re requesting if they could just check it out. They could never find it over there either and talk to the manager. Manager looked in his records and they don't have any record of ever carrying anything, in, at least in our region where we are. So anyway, I, we paid $149 for it. I opened it up with pretty great expectations and it has some good pros. It also has some cons. And so I'm gonna go ahead and do a review. This may be a great thing for you in your situation. Um, for us, it is about our plan C or D in using this, and we're gonna go over it. So here is this little stove. It is called a Vesta, V-E-S-T-A. It is a self-powered indoor space heater and stove. It came in this box, and I want to read you what the claims are. Off-grid indoor space heater, great for emergency use. Compact and portable, weighs less than nine pounds. Warms up to 200 square feet with heat-powered fan. Fueled by canned heat, safe for indoor use. Built-in stove, cook food, or boil water. All right, now keep in mind that they're claiming that you can cook food and boil water. We're going to test that out. So the thing that really intrigued me about this with my scientific background was that this fan that propels the heat without electricity is a Peltier device. And I have always been fascinated with Peltier devices. And if you are unfamiliar with that term, what a Peltier device does, it, that it, it has a, a reservoir of heat and then a reservoir of cold and then a um, kind of a thermoelectric generator thing that fits between the two. And as the heat crosses the cold, it generates volts, and that thermoelectric generator turns that into usable electricity that runs the fan. You almost think it's getting power without, with, with nothing, except it is the heat that powers the whole thing, and we'll talk about that when we get to uh, the point where we're going to look at that aspect of it. So. It comes in the box all packaged like this. I'm going to set the box aside. We take it out of the box and it's all like this. And it has a little sheet of paper that says first steps, which is very convenient. And essentially what you do is you lift out. This is like the wind tunnel. And the little fan is right back here. I'm not sure if you can see it. Yeah. Can you see it okay? Yeah. Okay. And then on the inside is a grid. So you pull that out and it goes right here. And then it comes with a little sign right here. And so after you unpack it, first pull out the snuffer. Oh, here's the snuffer right here. So we're going to pull that snuffer out. And so it's just the right size to snuff out the canned heat that we'll be using in just a minute. And then you pull out the canned heat tray using the snuffer. And so the instructions want you to use the snuffer anytime it has this little <clears throat> edge on it right here that you just pull right there. And you pull out this tray. And they want you to use that every time you manipulate this tray. It's a safety thing because sometimes it might get a little bit hot. And then on this tray, um, goes the heat. They sent two cans of heat, and this, by the way, is by um, Instafire, if you're familiar with that company. This is six hour canned heat extra hot, it says. And so they sent two. It holds three. I wish they would have sent three, but they sent two. And so we bought some, and um, ours is just um, gas one six hour heat. 
And so the way that these need to be arranged in this tray, the uh, tray is numbered slot one, two, and three, and it is really important that you always have heat under number one because it is the number one slot that powers this Peltier fan. And so you'll see why that is important. Okay, now I'm going to take the lid off of this and we're going to put the second one of theirs. Theirs are $6 a can. This that we bought online was $2 a can. Is there really a difference? I'll tell you what we found. So I'm doing the second one of theirs right in this number two slot and I'm putting the other one that we bought right there. And then, so we're supposed to use the snuffer and push it all the way in. So now we are loaded. This is the stove part. If we want to heat a room, we have to add the wind tunnel part with the fan. So the first thing that we are going to do is we're going to um, run a few tests on it. Now I've done some tests and I'm going to tell you what the results are. So I'm going to light these three and Jim can come over and, and uh, take a picture of these while I light them. So here's the one in the number one slot. Here's the middle one. And the gas one can heat. And it takes a minute for them to what people call bloom to come to a full flame and they get there pretty quickly. Now uh, this is the little stove right here. Now the, the downside of this is that it's long and narrow and most pans are round like this pan that I'm going to use right here. And so I conducted some experiments in some of the reviews I read, people were complaining that they never could get water to boil. And so I wondered about that. Now I am using the two extra hot um, cans that, were, that came with this product. And I am putting two cups of water in the pot and covering it with a lid. Now the results of my original testing, I was thinking that what if I wanted to warm up soup or warm up a stew or something of that nature. Now these little canisters of canned heat are specifically designed for putting under chafing dishes and trays serving food at buffets. And generally it heats up the water. The food is hot when they bring it in. And then these cans of food, are, uh, these cans of heat are designed to keep the food warm, not to cook the food, but rather to keep the food warm. So knowing that, I was really curious about whether or not the complaints by others who could never get the water to boil might have some validity. And so I tested a quart of water and the water was not cold. Our water doesn't come super cold out of our tap. It was probably about 70 degrees. And um, I used three of, um, three of ours, yeah, three of the gas one ones under it to test. And after 25 minutes, the temperature, I ch checked the temperature all throughout, the temperature leveled off at 175 degrees and I could never get a quart of water to boil. So then I put the two that came from the company that are extra hot and cost three times as much as the Gas One ones that we bought and I tried out those. After 25 minutes it leveled off at about 73, 74, it appeared maybe to keep climbing, so I let it go for 30 minutes where it leveled off at 175, never did bring water to a boil. So then last night I did some more testing and I tested two cups of water instead of a quart. Now the caveat here is that we are at 5,000 feet. So does that affect boiling? Yes, it does. But what's puzzling to me is that our boiling temperature is 203 degrees. So our water should boil 
before people at sea level who have to go all the way up to 212 to get a boil. We're down here to get a boil. Now, our boil is not as hot as sea level boil at 212. Ours is only at 203. And therefore, we generally have to cook things a little bit longer because the, the temperature is lower. But still, I just felt like it should boil if it was going to boil, and it never did. Then last night, once again, I was just using the two that I'm using right now, and I put a, a timer on it again, and after 20 minutes, I did get it up to 202.4, which was just under our boiling point, and it was just a little simmer, little tiny bubbles on the bottom. It was not a rolling boil. And so we are making little tiny bubbles right here now. So you're talking about putting a pint in or a quart in this, last night as well as this morning? No, this is, I'm testing only two cups, oh, which is a pint. Which is a pint. All right, so I'm testing the temperature right now. It's hundred and. It's still climbing. It's at 124 right now. And so after 20 minutes last night, it did come up to a little bit of a simmer. Now, what this tells me is that if, if I were trying to actually cook something from raw to cook stage, like um, stew or a soup with raw ingredients, it would take a really long time to do that and may never come to an actual boil. But again, I'm at 5,000 feet. It might be different at your elevation, but just keep that in mind. And so this went on for 20 minutes, and we're going to come back after it has been 20 minutes, and I'll show you what I mean by how close to a boil this one came. So we will be back when this comes to the hottest simmer that I could get it. After 22 minutes, we do have boiling. Let's check it out. So just a kind of a simmer boil. And my temperature gauge is reading 200, 201. Different places in the pot have different. Right over here, it's 200, where the bubbles are. So we're up to, this is a simmer. It's not a true boil because it's not reaching 203. It's not a rolling boil. But it is plenty hot to serve something that is already pre-cooked after you have warmed it up. It will just take a long time. At least at our elevation, it will take a long time. All right, so we're going to set this aside and see how it does cooking some bacon and eggs. I'm also using a round skillet that spans the two flames. The, both flames are coming up underneath this. And remember, this third one is off because it would miss the mark entirely. So we're going to let that heat up for just a minute. And I'm going to put two half slices of bacon in here. It would be such a shame for that bacon to just lie there all insulted that it wasn't getting enough heat to cook thoroughly for us. But I tried this last night and after a little while, it finally was able to cook the bacon. It took about 10, maybe 12 minutes. Do you remember what I told you, Jim? Was it 12 minutes? Something. 10 or 12 minutes, I can't remember. But it does take a little bit of time. And then um, while this was still cooking and getting toward getting done, I cracked the egg and put it on this side and then the white ran under the bacon and made a big mess. So I'm going to um, cook the egg separately while we do this. So I'm going to go ahead and start my timer. I'm starting a stopwatch. And we'll see how long this takes to cook. So I see a little bit of bubbling right here under the flame here. I'm even hearing a little sizzle, yay. Yeah. All right, so we will come back when, we're, when it's looking more like it's getting cooked. We are three minutes and 42 seconds into this bacon cooking and we're hearing, we're hearing sizzling.
We are getting a little bit of browning. Nice sizzle. All right, we'll keep on going. So I'm taking the temperature of this cooking bacon. It's in the 190s. It's 195 and still going up, and we have kind of a nice brown color on this. So it's hot enough to cook bacon. What's the time frame on this? Oh. Seven minutes, 16 seconds, and counting. Not quite done. I'm going to move that bacon way off to the side here, let it continue cooking, and we're going to add the egg. So, looks like it's also going to cook the egg just fine. Well, I know it is because I practiced this last night. Let that bacon continue to cook a little bit. I don't like raw bacon at all. I like it to be very cooked through and crispy. But Jim eats bacon no matter what condition it's in. <laughs> so. I'm just an animal, that's all. <laughs> it's such an animal. <laughs> the advantage that I have is that this is a cast iron skillet. And cast iron will trap and hold the heat for a really long time. And so it's a much more steady temperature and would be just great for cooking on this little stove. Okay, now it's getting waterlogged in the fat, so I'm going to move them off. This one is done how I like it, but the other one is still just a little bit raw. So the other one is for me, is that right? The other one is for you. <laughs> yeah. Total time on cooking the egg last night was five minutes. Looks like it's going to be about the same for today. And this egg is done. So this was a success, even though it did take a little bit of time, but that's okay. So here is the finished product. And we'll set that aside for Jim's breakfast. Total time. Oh, total time. 10 minutes, 24 seconds. Stop. Okay. So I'm going to now take the snuffer and pull out the tray. Relight the third one. It's on. And push it back in place. Because now we are going to do the heater. The wind tunnel just fits right on top and because this is the number one slot here we want the fan piece to go over the number one slot. So we're just going to fit this just like that. Now it does take a couple of minutes for the fan to start. You can see right now I'm going to reach in here with this kind of twirl the fan so that you can see the fan. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. So it's not going yet. It has to build up the heat in that heat sink, S-Y-N-C, the heat sink that it's called. And then here's the cool sink and then the um, thermoelectric generator between them to turn that volts that is when the heat crosses the cold, it creates volts and then that's turned into electricity to run the fan. And the fan, when it's, it gets hot enough, once there's enough heat generated in the heat sink, then the fan is going to turn on. And it increases in speed as the heat increases. So um, this is the part of the, here, there goes the fan. So it's going just a little bit. It's not moving this. This is a strip of Kleenex. Not going strong enough to move that yet, but I am feeling heat coming out there. The heat coming out, this is right now 
Um, moving up, 95, 101. So it's moving up fairly fast. It's up to 150. As you can see, the fan is gaining some strength. No electricity, not plugged in. It is completely generated by the heat. All right, so now it's really going. So about two feet away, it's measuring 130. When Jim and I were testing it, when we first got it, we moved probably about, he stands about six feet back with the camera right now, and it was, uh, the air around him was about 80 degrees. So this little heater does a pretty good job of heating the room. Now our kitchen breakfast area is about 200 square feet, but we have a very open room, no closing of the doors at all. Um, between the kitchen and dining room or the open hallway and in the living room it is a high ceiling so uh, we could probably get pretty good heat here uh, but it would take a while to heat up 200 square feet and one thing that you want to be very careful of with any kind of an open flame is that you don't want to close everything off completely uh, you don't want to hover under a blanket with this heater um, it needs oxygen because of uh, the open flame situation, and it needs to have some ventilation to resupply oxygen. So you'll need to crack a window a little bit when you're using it, but it is very safe to use indoors. So this may be just the thing to, um, for some of you that, have, that live in smaller apartments or smaller homes or trailer homes or even RVs, um, to help with heat. Um, the cost of these little canisters is important to consider. So we will not be buying their brand at $6 a can because I frankly did not see that much difference between the performance of the $6 cans versus the $2 cans. And these are just guess one. Uh, maybe there are some other differences. Um, in terms of the cooking, um, I would not use this for cooking simply because it takes such a long time. Um, I have seen um, on the internet people who have pots of soup just boiling away on this little stove. I'm not sure what they are using for fuel. Um, I can't imagine that it's this, although it may be. I just don't know. I don't have any idea what they are using for fuel. In a pinch, one of the things that I would do is I would use our little alcohol stove under here in place of the three. I would just put this little stove, and I've tested this right underneath, and I do have a little bit of fuel in here I can show you. Yes, I do have fuel in here. And I can show you the flame that is generated by this alcohol stove. And I don't know if you can see that, if I put this up, can you see it with that as a backdrop? Does that help at all? No, I can't see it. Does this help at all? Oh. Bits and pieces, let's see. So the flame is up to about right here. It's not bloomed yet, meaning it's not coming out the little holes that are drilled. But I tested this alcohol burner in the uh, Vesta and I was able to boil two cups of water to a rolling boil in eight minutes. And so if I were going to use this to heat my food, oh, it just popped, no, there it goes. Did it finally kick in? Yeah, it finally Is kicked in. I wonder if this black better? Can you see it better now? Oh, there we go. A little bit here. Yeah, there we are. Okay. Yeah, that's a good... So if, if we had to depend on this in, an, in a time of emergency, I would want to have a lot of these stored. I would buy them by the case. That's what we did. We bought a case of, was it 20, Jim? I thought it was 12. I don't remember. But we got them for about $2 a piece. And I would want several cases of these stored. 
The other thing that I would do is I would not use this for heating food because if you think about it, you cannot do both at the same time with this little machine. You either have the wind tunnel blowing heat out into the room to keep you warm or the wind tunnel off to the side and you're using this to heat your food. So alcohol stoves are very inexpensive. This one was, um, you can get them from $5 to $65. This one was 19 and it's a good brand. This is a solo stove um, alcohol burner and you can get, I don't, I, I have some out. You can get little stands that go around these alcohol burners where you can put your pot right on top of it. And, um, or you can even make one out of a number 10 can and um, uh, just kind of a shield and a platform for putting your pan, depending on what you're trying to heat up, whether it's a, um, something to make a, a hot chocolate or hot coffee or a, a larger pan like I was using to heat up soup or stew, whatever. Um, this alcohol burner is um, much faster, but the, the fuel that we use is this uh, heat in the yellow bottle. And um, there are a number of things that you can use. And so you just also have to take into consideration the cost of the fuel for either one. But I really like this as a space heater. I think it's great. I'm not fond of it for cooking. I was never able to get a good rolling boil. I'm gonna put this alcohol stove out. and let it cool down and then put the lid back on. So those are some alternatives, the pros and cons of this little machine. Um, and I, of course, am fascinated with the science behind it, the engineering of the Peltier device, which is just incredible to me and just speaks of such ingenuity to figure that out and get it going. So this is our review of the Vesta stove by Instant Fire. And I hope that you find it useful and it might help you make a decision, either yes or no. Uh, you can go on our website to learn more about the Vesta stove by just clicking on the Amazon, on, clicking on this on our Amazon store and reading what Amazon has to say about it. But see if you can find it for $99 someplace. On our store, it's still $149 last time I checked. So shop around, and if you're interested, see if you can't find it for $99. So thank you for joining us for this review, and we will see you very soon with another video.